Okay. Today's lesson, I mean, did you know that we're in danger of losing Christmas? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I understand it's the biggest and most popular holiday of the year, but we're in danger of losing it just the same. There are elements in our society today that are very subtly eating away at the true significance of the Christmas season. Now, some of you may be wondering how that could be possible. Isn't Christmas the time of the year when people everywhere, whether they're religious or not, will exhibit the best in human values? Uh, isn't Christmas the time of the year when uh, we promote the spirit of peace and brotherhood uh, on the earth? Isn't Christmas the time of the year when, the char uh, when the charity and kindness is, uh, is everywhere? Christmas is supposed to be the season we, when we put everything else on hold and we gather our families together and exchange gifts in honor of that day. And when all is said and done, don't all those things capture the essence of Christmas? Well, not quite. All of those things are good, wholesome values, but they only hint at the real meaning of Christmas. What Christmas is really supposed to be about is the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, the promised Messiah, the one who, according to the angel Gabriel, will save the, his people from their sins. And there are two prevailing philosophies today that are stealing Christmas away from us. The first one is an effort to mythologize the Christmas story. The second one is the tendency, even among Christians, to secularize it. Now, when I talk about that effort to some people to mythologize Christmas, uh, what I'm referring to is a tendency to reduce the Christmas story down to the point where it becomes nothing more than an interesting uh, fairy tale. Over the years, singers and storytellers have uh, embellished the story to the point where most people really don't know where the Bible leaves off and where the fables begin. Instead of being the main theme of the holiday, the birth of Christ is turning into the mythology that created the holiday. For example, do you know how many wise men there were mentioned in the Bible? Tradition has turned them into visitors from the east through, uh, into three kings. Uh, we've even given them names. They are Caspar, Balthazar, and Melchior. Popular songs will place animals in the stable and turn them into characters right out of Aesop's fables. Uh, our image of the uh, manger scene has been given to us by the greeting card people. We uh, usually imagine the manger scene well, uh, with snow on the ground and angels singing overhead and lots of people who came to worship the newborn king. We even imagine that one of them was a little drummer boy. But not one iota of that is found in the biblical account of the birth of Christ. Did you know that the Magi didn't even visit Jesus on the night he was born? Scripture tells us that they found him in a house, not a stable. Most likely, Mary and Joseph were only in that stable for a very short time. You see, when Mary and Joseph arrived in Bethlehem, Mary's labor, start, labor started. And when they found out that there was no room in the inn, Joseph didn't want Mary to have the baby in the street. So he left her in the stable while he uh, went to, to find a place for them to stay. And since her labor had just started, he figured that the baby wasn't going to be around for at least a little while. And remember, Bethlehem was Joseph's hometown. I'm sure that he had relatives there that he could stay with. And by the time he returned, Jesus had been born. So, back to the Magi. The Greek word that's used to describe Jesus when the Magi visited it is pahidion. Uh, that word is uh, used to describe a toddler, not an infant. The Greek word for infant is brephos. So the Magi's visited, uh, may, uh, visit may have come weeks or even months after he was born. Some people actually feel that Jesus may have been uh, two years old when the, by the time they got there. That's why Herod ordered the children under two to be killed. Well, the facts about the Magi have become lost in the mythology that has uh, grown up around these visits and has actually overgrown the true biblical account. <laughs> Let me ask you a few trivia questions. How many Magi were there? Well, the Magi kings, did the angels sing when Christ was born? And how many people were present when Mary actually gave birth to Jesus? Now think about it, I'm going to give you the answers a little bit later. Okay, the second one comes from the way our society has secularized the celebration of Christmas. Now I'm not talking about Santa Claus, red nosed reindeers, and talking snowmen, <clears throat> although that is a part of it. The real danger lies in the way that the spiritual values of Christmas are given away to crass consumerism. Christmas has become the ultimate holiday for drunken parties, uh, wild spending, and gluttony of all sorts. 
those things seem to mask the way the world celebrates Christmas and many uh, uh, Christians seem to be following suit. This trend really isn't hard to document. Just stop by one of the shopping malls during the week before Christmas and you'll see a graphic evidence of how the real Christmas is slipping away from us. Pay attention to what and how the, store, the stores advertise. Listen to how people talk and what they're saying. Stop by a card store and look at the Christmas cards. Then try to imagine yourself as an alien visiting this planet for the first time. You've never even heard of Jesus Christ or Christmas. What kind of message do you think you would get about Christmas from what you were hearing and seeing? More importantly, what kind of message do you think God is getting when we do those things? Now let me ask you, how can we really uh, rationalize and all this self-indulgence by calling it a celebration of his birth when his cradle was only an animal's feeding trough and some rough cloth was a blanket? I read a story in a newspaper several years ago about a rich family in Boston who were, uh, had a christening party for their new baby. About half an hour into the party, when it came time to bring the baby out, the mother made a tragic discovery. The bed where she had left the baby sleeping was piled high with coats and the baby had suffocated under them. This scene is the perfect illustration of what's happening to Christmas today. We have lost the idea of that Christmas is first and foremost the celebration of the birth of our Savior. The baby Jesus is, is being lost under the wrapping paper and the commotion. Now please don't understand me. I'm not suggesting for a moment that our Christmas celebration needs to be solemn, somber, or grim religious uh, celebration or observance. Christmas should be a time of joy and happiness. The Savior of mankind has finally arrived. But it shouldn't be the manufactured sentiment and gluttony that has marks the way that the world celebrates Christmas today. Our joy should come from the realization of what Christmas is really all about, knowing the one whose birth we're celebrating. Jesus is real. The story of his birth is not a myth. We shouldn't romanticize it or settle for a fanciful legend that renders the story meaningless. Mary and Joseph are real people. When she went into labor and there was no room in the inn, that was a frightening experience for them. The manger where Mary laid him was cold and hard. The stable smelled like the animals that occupied it. And the shepherds who came by later probably didn't smell much better. So that first Christmas was a far cry from the romanticized version that we see on the greeting cards. But you know something? That's what makes it so wonderful. That baby was God. That is the heart and soul of the Christmas message. There weren't crowds of people there. There were only a few shepherds and they didn't show up until later. But there will come a day when every knee will bow before that baby and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. One Sunday morning, a little girl came home from Sunday school waving a picture that she had drawn in class. The teacher had asked the class uh, to draw a Christmas picture and when the, she showed the picture to her mother, she told her that the teacher had said that it was the most unusual Christmas picture she'd ever seen. Well, after studying the picture for a moment, the little girl's mother came to the same conclusion. She said to her daughter, this is a really pretty picture, but why is everybody riding on the back of an airplane? The little girl was somewhat disappointed that the meaning of the picture wasn't immediately obvious to her mother. So she said, don't you see, that's the flight into Egypt. Her mother said, okay, well, what's the mean looking man in the front? And by this time, the little girl was really getting annoyed. And she said, that's Pontius the pilot. <laughs> the mother said, I see. And there's Mary and Joseph. And, but who's the fat man sitting behind Mary? And the little girl said, can't you tell? That's round John Virgin. <laughs> little boy was once asked by a Sunday school teacher how many angels he could name. And the boy thought for a moment. He said, well, there's Michael, Gabriel, Mark, and Harold. The teacher said, I know Michael and Gabriel, but it was Mark and Harold. And the boy said, haven't you ever heard the song, Mark and Harold, angels sing? <laughs> we, and we laugh at that, but that's, uh, the sad fact is, the mixed up per, uh, perspective that Christmas uh, had for, for those children isn't really that far off from the muddled notions that are the average adult carries around today. Today, Christmas is a combination of pagan ideas, superstitions, traditions, legends, and just plain ignorance. And what I'm trying to do in a time before Christmas is to make an attempt to sort it all out and separate the fact from the fiction. And the best way to go for the answers is to the Bible. 
The Christmas story begins in the Bible much earlier than you might think. The Old Testament is filled with prophecies promising the Savior who will offer salvation to the entire world. Though the centerpiece of all the prophecies concerning Christmas is found in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This prophecy was written by Isaiah almost 600 years before Christ was born. So we know that it is a prophecy and not something that was written after the fact. And the details of Isaiah's other prophecies concerning the Messiah were fulfilled too precisely by Jesus for the connection to be written off as just pure coincidence. For example, Isaiah said that Jesus would be born of a virgin. That's in chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And the virgin's name was Mary. And we'll have more to say about that later. But for now, we'll just say that this prediction is one of the most startling details found in Isaiah's prophecy. The description of his crucifixion, is, which is found in Isaiah chapter 53, has become known as the conscience of the synagogue. Jews refuse to even read it anymore because it describes Jesus' death too accurately. So rather than trying to explain the passage, they simply ignore it. Okay, what is Isaiah trying to tell us when he says, and shall come, call his name Emmanuel? Well, the original Hebrew text, the word Emmanuel, is a compound word. It combines the word em and a. Um, the word a means with us, and the word el means God. So literally it says, with us is God. Well, if we could, could condense the entire Christmas story into three little words, it would be God with us. You see, we tend to focus our Christmas story on the infancy of a human Christ, but the greater truth surrounding Christmas lies in his deity. That little baby was the creator of the universe. The Jews thought that Isaiah was predicting the birth of the human king, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. But the Jews got it wrong when they assumed that it would be an earthly government. This king was the ruler over all of creation. See, for us, to a, for us, a child is born that speaks of his humanity. I mean, Jesus is going to come to earth any way he wanted to. I mean, he, he could have appeared as a full-grown man. I mean, after all, Adam wasn't born, so God certainly has the ability to do that if he wants to. But he chose to be born just like we were. He chose to begin his earthly life just like any other human being. And while he was here on earth, he lived just like any other human being. He got hungry just like any other human being. He got tired just like any other human being. He laughed just like any other human being. And he shed tears when he was sad just like any other human being. He was also tempted just like any other human being. And ultimately, he would die just like any other human being. But notice what Isaiah says next. To us a son is given. The child was born... But the Son was given. This speaks of his deity. John began his gospel with these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Compared to that verse, Genesis 1-1 happened 15 minutes ago. The second member of the Trinity was given to us as a Savior, and he came into the world as a little baby. And don't think for a moment that he was a helpless child. That little baby had the power to order the stars to leave their place in the sky, and they would have obeyed him. Friends, God was in that manger. Lots of people today are willing to accept Jesus as their Messiah, but they don't want him to be their God. They're willing to welcome him as the son of David, but not as the son of God. They don't, they, they don't mind celebrating the birth of a baby, but they don't want to hear about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And every cult in the world today denies the deity of Jesus. The two biggest are the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. You see, people today will sing about his nativity, but then they'll reject his authority. They're willing to adore him if he just stays a baby in a manger. But they refuse to pay homage to him if, they, if he is their God. So they'll incorporate all the trappings of Christmas into their celebration. There is a star in the manger and the wise men, the shepherds, and Mary and Joseph. But they just can't seem to grasp the idea that that baby in that manger is, is God wrapped in human flesh. 
As a result, the world today totally ignores the core truth of everything that Christmas is all about. And instead of honoring Jesus at Christmas, they actually mock him. Satan must love the way the world celebrates Christmas today. He must really make his day to see the blatant sin and blasphemy and rejecting Christ that's being perpetrated by the very people who were claiming to celebrate his birth. Sure, they'll give lip service to the fact that Jesus was born, but at the same time, they'll ignore the main point of the holiday. And that's the fact that Jesus is almighty God who came to earth in human flesh. So I said earlier, Christmas is not all about a savior in a manger. Christmas is about God in a manger. The fact that he was born under such humble circumstances was never intended to diminish the reality that he is God. But the way that the world celebrates Christmas today does just that. You see, for the majority of people in the Christian world today, Christmas doesn't have any significant meaning at all. None of us in this room, me included, can even begin to fathom what it means for God to be born in a stable. How can I even begin to explain to you what it means for the almighty and eternal God to become a tiny infant? It would be like you deciding to be born as a fire ant because you love those ants so much that you're willing to become one of them and you can eat all the amdro and die so that they could live. And even that doesn't come close to explaining it. You see, that's something that our human minds can't grasp. If we tried for the rest of our lives, we could never understand why an infinite God would assume a human body and enter a world that he knew would kill him. Nor can we ever explain how he could become 100% human, but stay 100% God at the same time. That's what theologians call the hypostatic union. People will offer the and wonder if he cried and messed his diaper just like other babies did. The answer is yes, he was fully human. And he had the same needs that any other human would have. And he was still fully God. And he possessed all the wisdom and power of God. But while he was here on earth, he gave up a lot of his power and relied on the Father for everything he needed. Now, how could he be fully human and fully God at the same time? I have no clue. But the Bible clearly teaches that he was. In many ways, Jesus uh, chose to give up the full application of some of his divine power, and he never stopped being God. I mean, after all, that's who he is. He couldn't stop being who he is. Instead, he chose to subjugate himself to the Father's will. People have been arguing for almost 2,000 years about, how Jesus, uh, about who Jesus really was. Cults have offered various explanations. He was one of many gods. He was a created being. He was an angel. He was a good teacher and a prophet. Mormons claim that he was just another spirit child of a space alien named Elohim, and Satan was his brother. Jehovah's Witnesses claim that he was the rearranged molecules of the archangel Michael, and he didn't really rise from the dead. God just rearranged, reassembled Michael's molecules, and he went back to heaven. Every one of those explanations makes him less than God. And there isn't a cult in the world that accepts the deity of Jesus Christ. But remember how John began his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything made uh, that was made. Well, a few verses later, John tells us who the Word was. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the one Son from the Father, of, uh, from the Father, full of grace and truth. There are other proofs of His deity. For one thing, He did things only God could do. Plus, He was omniscient. John tells us, but Jesus, on His part, did not entrust Himself to them because He knew all people. And it needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. He knew all about Nathaniel before they even met. He knew all there was to know about the Samaritan woman at the well. He created wine out of water at a wedding in Cana. And he took a little boy's bag lunch and created enough food to feed 5,000 people with it. 5,000 men. It should be like fifteen to 20,000 people actually there. No human being would ever be capable of doing those things. Only God can create things. He healed people who were hopelessly ill. He gave sight to blind men who had never seen a day in their lives. He restored hearing to people who had never heard a word in their lives. 
Only God can do those things, and he actually raised people from the dead. There has never been another person like Jesus Christ. But let me read to you the one particular passage that was written by Paul that sums it up best. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Paul wrote that passage to the Colossians. And that city was under the influence of a false teaching that would go on to become known as Gnosticism. It was developed by a group of uh, elite intellectuals who thought that they were the only ones in the world who could understand the truth. They felt that the truth was so complex that it was impossible for anyone but them to understand it. Democrats think that way today. They, these people taught that matter was evil and spirit was good. And since God was spirit, there was no way that he could possibly create evil matter. So they thought that in the beginning, God created spirit beings, like they called emanations, and that these spirit beings were good. And then these spirit beings had offspring that were successively lesser beings, until finally the descendants of these emanations became evil matter in the form of Adam and Eve. Now, if that were true, then Jesus couldn't possibly have a body because that would be mixing good and evil. So they taught that Jesus was one of these emanations and that his body was only an illusion. This teaching is what prompted John to write, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ was come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard is coming and now is already in the world. John and Paul are both confirming that Jesus is God in human flesh. Ironically, some of the cults that try to deny the deity of Christ will actually use what Paul wrote to the Colossians to prove their claim. They say that the phrase, he is the image of the invisible God, meant that Jesus was merely a created being who bore the outward image of God, but was just uh, an illusion. Well, they can be said of all human beings. I mean, Genesis 1.27 tells us that man is made in the image of God. But in our case, we only resemble God and that we bear some of his traits. We can speak and reason, we can, and we have a built-in awareness of what is right and what is wrong. In other words, we have a conscience, and we bear an eternal soul. And that passage from Colossians, the word image is the Greek word icon, and the word means exact replica. This goes far beyond something that simply looks like the original. It speaks of an exact duplicate. Paul is telling us that God himself was, a man, was manifested in the flesh of Jesus. Jesus himself said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Now, I've mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again. When the Bible calls Jesus the Son of God, the word Son is translating the Greek word huios. Now, the huios was the person who had a right of the inheritance. And as the heir, the huios held the power and authority that was equal to the father's. Well, since the huios was usually the eldest son, most often or not, the word is translated with the word son. But the huios didn't have to be a natural offspring. The huios was whoever the father said was going to be the huios. Well, the best illustration of this that I know of is seen in the movie Ben-Hur. After Judah Ben-Hur saved the life of the Roman consul Quintus Arius, the two became very close. Well, even though Judah Ben-Hur wasn't Arius' natural son, he named him as his huios and gave him a signet ring that bestowed on him the power and authority that was equal to his. So to see Jesus referred to as the Son of God doesn't diminish Jesus in any way. It's telling us that Jesus has the right to everything that the Father has and that his power and his authority is equal to the Father's. Now scripture repeatedly describes God as being invisible. John wrote, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. 
And Paul wrote, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The fact is, God told Moses on Mount Sinai that no man could see him and live. Jesus himself said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. But through Christ, the invisible God has been made visible. God's full likeness is revealed in Christ. People will talk about the miracle of the transfiguration. I'm sure that you all know the story. If you'd like to read it again, it's in Matthew chapter 17, Mark chapter 9, and Luke chapter 9. And Jesus went up to the top of the hill with three of his disciples, and when they arrived, he glowed bright with the glory of God, and Moses and Elijah appeared with him. But you know something? That was not the miracle. The miracle comes in the fact that he was able to keep all that glory hidden while he was here on earth. When these disciples, what these disciples saw on that hilltop was what Christ really looks like. And when they saw it, they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Paul said, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. You see, the, that baby wasn't just sent by God, he was God. Nothing is lacking, he is totally God in the fullest possible sense. Now Paul also said he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The people who reject Christ's deity will use this verse to show that Jesus was only a created being. Well, the word firstborn is the Greek word prototokos, and it describes Jesus' rank and not his origin. In Jewish society, the Greek word prototokos was a synonym for the word huios, in that it referred to the heir. But since that can be more than one heir, the prototokos referred to more, uh, more to rank than it did to the birth order. The literal translation of prototokos is the word foremost. Under Jewish law, the eldest son was to receive a double portion of the inheritance because he was the one who was to care for his widowed parent, which was usually the mother. But again, the person didn't have to be the eldest son. It was whoever the father named to be the foremost heir. Well, in Jesus' case, he was God. So when he was, was born as a human being, he was the foremost and the firstborn of creation, again, of all the other human beings, because he was the one who was there before anything was created. He was the one who held the highest rank. He was the one who had the right of inheritance ahead of anyone else. Well, in a royal family, this also meant that he was the one who had the right to rule the kingdom. He is the one whose authority is equal to the king. So what this verse is saying is that Jesus is the one who is the supreme authority to rule. He is the one who has the right to inherit all of creation. And since the Father is eternal, so is the Son. And this means that they were both ruled together. You see, before there can be an eternal Father, there has to be an eternal Son. And if Jesus has the right to rule over all of creation, then he must be just as much God as the Father is. Now, we can also go to Hebrews chapter 1 to get a confirmation of this truth. Verse 2 identifies Christ as the one through whom the world was made. But in the last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom all he also created the world. So not only is that little baby in the manger the foremost heir of creation, nothing was created without him. Now think about that, uh, what that means. Have you ever considered the size of this universe? If it doesn't blow your mind, you really haven't thought about it. The sun is so big that it would hold 1,200,000 planets the size of the Earth. And if that wasn't enough to blow your mind, there would be room left over for 4,300,000 additional objects the size of our moon. The next nearest star to us is Alpha Centauri, and that star is five times bigger than our sun. And the star Betelgeuse, which is in the Orion uh, constellation, is 248 times bigger than our sun. Now, light travels at 669,600,000 miles an hour. But even if you could travel that fast, it will still take you 100,000 years to reach the edge of our galaxy. And the Milky Way is only one galaxy out of millions that we know exist. Can you imagine the amount of power that would be needed to control just our little part of the universe? The sheer magnitude of the universe is incomprehensible to the human mind. 
Hebrews 1 verse 3 tells us he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he holds the universe by the word of his power. You ever stop to ponder that idea? The entire universe is held together by the power of his word and all that power was contained in that little baby that was lying in a feed trough in a stable in Bethlehem on that first Christmas. Did you know that the scientists don't really know what holds the universe together? Everything in this universe is made up of tiny objects called atoms. These atoms are built like little solar systems with electrons that have a negative charge revolving around a nucleus that's made up of uh, protons which have no charge at all and uh, or, or uh, protons which have a positive charge and neutrons which have no charge at all. Now every school child who has ever played with a magnet knows that like charges repel each other and opposite charges attract each other. But every atom in this universe violates that law. The protons all have positive charges. But even though they have like charges, they stay together. They should fly apart. Well, the electrons all have negative charges, so they should be attracted to the positively charged protons, but they're not. Scientists call the force that holds an atom together the atomic force. Catchy name, let's think. You see, the scientists may be smart, but that doesn't make them mean, uh, imaginative. In fact, most of them really aren't as smart as we think they are. After all, most of them still believe in the theory of evolution. Nothing times nothing equals everything. Well, they have no idea what it is, but they do know how strong it is. I mean, that's Einstein's theory. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. The atomic force is estimated to be over one billion tons per cubic inch of matter. That is one followed by 38 zeros times greater than the force of gravity. A German scientist named Otto Gale once calculated that if we could actually use all of the power in a single drop of gasoline, we could power a car over 400 times around the world. That is 10 million miles to the drop. Well, I'm sorry, but that is a scientist who has entirely too much time on his hands. <clears throat> well, scientists have no idea what the source of all that power is, only that it's enormous. We know where it comes from, and so did the writer of the book of Hebrews. He said, Christ upholds the universe by the word of his power. And so did Paul. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You see, if Jesus would have, did, all Jesus would have to do would be to withhold that power for one nanosecond, and everything in creation would fly apart. And all that power was lying in a manger that died in Bethlehem. If just thinking about that doesn't give you, uh, give Christmas a whole new meaning for you, then you better lie down because you did. So why would a God who has all that power want to come to earth and be born as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem? Well, he did it in order to make peace between himself and mankind. Remember, all of us have sinned. There are no exceptions. Paul said, none is righteous, no not one. Why? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God hates sin. And he has to respond to sin with his wrath. If he didn't do that, he would be uh, giving a tacit approval to sin, and that would mean that he wouldn't be righteous. See, God can't simply ignore sin and still be a just God. So in order for God to maintain his perfect righteousness and his perfect justice, sin must be dealt with. And since the wages of sin is death, that means that anyone who sins must die. But that would, even, that would require God to destroy every person on earth. And he didn't want to do that. But if someone else would agree to pay the penalty on behalf of all of mankind, God's justice would be satisfied and that would open the door for his forgiveness. Well, even if God could find someone who would volunteer to do that, they would have to have, be qualified to do that. And first and foremost, it would mean that someone who had no sin on their own. Otherwise, they would be simply suffering the consequences of their own sin. So even if he could find someone who was willing to volunteer, God couldn't be righteous if he just ignored their sin and arbitrarily punished them 
for someone else's sin. And this wasn't a person on earth who, who was sinless. Well, the only one who was capable of, of assuming that punishment that was owed by, for our sin would be God himself. And only Jesus, who was both God and man, could resolve that conflict. So even before the universe was created, he decided that he would come down to earth as a human being and pay the penalty for us by dying on the cross. Well, how could he make this decision before the creation? I mean, Adam and Eve weren't even made yet. Well, God didn't create humans as mindless robots. They were created with a free will. You see, for a human being to genuinely obey God, they must have the ability to disobey him. And God is omniscient, and he knew that sooner or later, Adam would sin. So even before he created anything, the plan for redemption was already in place. And to do that, he had to come to earth as a human being and live a totally sinless life. And that meant that he couldn't even have one sinful thought. That way, he would qualify to suffer the penalty for our sin by suffering God's wrath in our place. That meant that God's justice would be satisfied. The writer of Hebrews wrote, For we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect was tempted as we are yet without sin. And since he is, has no sin, he was able to die as a sacrifice to bear the penalty for our sins so that we wouldn't have to. All we have to do now is accept what he did for us and agree to submit to his lordship. Then, since we have accepted his death as our own, God is free to forgive us because the penalty that we owed for our sin has already been paid. Even so, there are still people out there who think that they can reconcile to be reconciled to God on their own. <clears throat> and in that case, they, they have a choice. They can live a totally sinless life. And since sin is, resides in the heart and not in the hands, that means that every thought has to be totally pure. Or they could pay the penalty for the sin themselves. And that requires an eternity in hell. So first and foremost, Christ, Christmas is a celebration of God's love for mankind. The baby lying in that manger is far more than a cute little infant. He is the very image of God. He is a prototokos. He was the one who created everything. That makes him foremost. He is the huios. He is the one whose power and authority is equal to the Father. That gives him the right to rule the universe because he is God. He took on the body of human flesh so that he could bear in that body the sins of the entire world. That sums up the entire Christmas message. But the incarnation of Christ is meaningless if it's not personal. I mean, he knows you better than you know yourself. He loves you anyway. He entered the world as a little baby so that he could die on a cross and bear the punishment for your sin. And he did it so that you could, he, you could enter into his presence. And your salvation isn't automatic. You have to respond. Paul wrote, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, God is the, uh, uh, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, even though Jesus is the icon, the exact image of God, not everybody is going to see that. The God of this age will blind the minds of the unbelievers so that they can't see the truth of the gospel. But it doesn't have to be that way. The God who dispels darkness, the one who said, let there be light, can also cause the light of his glory to shine from that manger in Bethlehem into your heart. All you have to do is respond in faith. Turn from your sin and accept the salvation that God has made for you. If you'll do that, then Christmas will truly be a time of celebration for you since you know, since you would have received the greatest gift any person could possibly receive, the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Well, did anybody come up with the answers to those trivia questions? Did the angels sing when, Christmas, when Christ was born? There's the answer. Even though one of the most popular Christmas carols of, that, of the time is Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Scripture doesn't say the angels sang. 
Uh, Luke 2 verse 13 says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, not singing, saying. In fact, there's only two times in Scripture that says the angels actually sang. One is in Job chapter 38 verse 7 where Job tells us how the angels sang at creation. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The term morning stars refers to angels. The angel Lucifer, before he fell and became Satan, was called the star of the morning, son of the dawn. That's in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. The second passage is in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 to 10. This passage tells us of a time when the four living creatures, which are angels, will join in with the 24 elders in singing a new song to Christ. So angels sang before the fall of man, and they're going to sing again when the curse of sin is removed. In the meantime, they minister without singing. It's like they, it's like they can't sing while the earth is still under the curse of sin. Okay, how many, of, how many people do you think were present when Mary actually gave birth to Jesus? The answer is nobody. Mary was all alone. It's in Luke chapter 2 verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths. And she laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. If there was someone there with her when Jesus was born, they would have done that and not her. So what probably happened was this. Mary was in labor, so she was in no condition to be walking all over town looking for a place to stay. So when they found out that that particular inn was filled, they went to the stable so that Mary could rest. And she stayed there while Joseph went out to find a place for them to stay. And remember that this was Joseph's hometown, so he had relatives there. Well, while he was gone, Mary gave birth to Jesus. And she is the one who wrapped him up and put him in a manger because there was no one else there to help her do that. But when you look at the greeting cards, you think that Jesus was born in Grand Central Terminal. The pictures they paint will show shepherds, angels, Joseph, magi, animals, and even a little drummer boy. But in reality, Mary was all alone. And as soon as Mary had received enough, uh, recovered enough so that she could walk, they probably left the stable. Make sure that you separate the myth from the truth as you celebrate Christmas this year. It isn't just the baby, uh, the birth of a baby. It is God himself coming to earth and wrapping himself in human flesh so that he could save this, this essential world from itself. All right, we're going to stop right here and pick this up next week. And next time we meet, we're going to try to answer the question that many people are struggling with today. Is the virgin birth really essential to the Christmas story? And then we'll look at some of the people who were present when Christ was born.